tonight. The sexual harassment crisis. Girls and the Boy Scouts. I would say it's probably a move of desperation. I think that's really financially driven and motivated. And the legend of Filthy Frank. The Syrian army, backed by Russia and Iran, says the last major city under Islamic State control has fallen. ISIS has held on to most of Deir Azor, near the Iraqi border, since 2014. It's at the center of Syria's oil production. On the Iraqi side of the border, forces have now entered Al Qaim, one of the last towns under ISIS control. A military judge ruled today that Army Sergeant Bo Bergdahl won't serve any prison time. Bergdahl pleaded guilty to endangering the troops who searched for him after he walked off his base in Afghanistan in 2009 and was captured by the Taliban. The judge did sentence the 31-year-old to be dishonorably discharged, demoted him to the rank of private, and ordered that he forfeit $1,000 a month of his pay for 10 months. On Twitter, President Trump called the decision a, quote, complete and total disgrace to our country and to our military. The United Nations is asking the Australian government to restore food, water, and health services to roughly 600 refugees and asylum seekers who have refused to leave an offshore detention center that closed this week. Faced with dwindling supplies, men inside the facility dug a well to get water. Last year, the Supreme Court of Papua New Guinea, where the Australian camp is located, found it unconstitutional and illegal. Both countries agreed to shut it down. But detainees say they're afraid for their safety if they're transferred elsewhere. The most comprehensive U.S. government report on what we know about the state of the climate came out today, and it affirms that climate change is primarily caused by human activities. Congress has ordered the report to be produced regularly, and the Trump administration approved releasing the latest update, even though it contradicts the administration's own views on climate change. In its response to the report today, the White House said, quote, the climate has changed and is always changing. The Justice Department is asking the Supreme Court to vacate a lower court's ruling that allowed a 17-year-old undocumented immigrant to get an abortion. Jane Doe had the procedure last week. The government wants the ruling vacated so that it won't apply to other pregnant minors seeking abortions. It's also asking for possible penalties against the ACLU, which represented the teen. The Justice Department is accusing the group of misleading the government about the timing of the abortion and effectively preventing the government from being able to stop it through the courts. ACLU legal director David Cole called the DOJ's claims baseless and said, quote, that government lawyers failed to seek judicial review quickly enough is their fault, not ours. Today, the New York Police Department said it's pursuing a case against Harvey Weinstein for an allegation that he raped an actress in 2010. We have an actual case here, um, so we are happy with where the investigation is right now. Weinstein has repeatedly denied accusations of non-consensual sex that started to become public last month. In the weeks following, new accusations of sexual harassment have emerged almost daily against other powerful men. Almost all of them have denied the allegations and were using the most conservative numbers available, but the tally of victims keeps rising. Workplace harassment isn't limited to powerful men at powerful companies. Almost a third of the roughly 90,000 charges received last year by the Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, called the EEOC, involved harassment, and nearly a quarter of those harassment charges were sexual harassment. But those numbers understate the problem. The EEOC estimates that only one in four individuals report workplace harassment, even though three out of five women say they've experienced it. Sex discrimination at work has been barred since the 1964 Civil Rights Act, but it took more than a decade for sexual harassment to be seen as a form of discrimination. In one of the earliest cases, a DC Department of Corrections employee named Sandra Bundy said that she was harassed by multiple male employees and her supervisor. When she tried to tell her supervisor's boss, he dismissed her too, so she filed a lawsuit. The court ruled against her, even though it agreed, quote, improper sexual advances were standard operating procedure, a fact of life, a normal condition of employment. At the time, sexual harassment wasn't a widely recognized legal concept. 
That changed thanks to the work of feminist legal scholars and activists. The phrase sexual harassment was used for the first time publicly in 1975, and in 1980, it was finally recognized by the EEOC as a form of discrimination. That legal revolution at least made it possible for women to sue over harassment. But over the years, the problem has remained pervasive, especially in low-wage jobs where workers are isolated, like farming and janitorial work, as well as in male-dominated industries like construction. The EEOC has received numerous complaints in the food service industry, too. In 2013, it settled a lawsuit on behalf of 89 female employees, including teenagers, who claimed they'd been subjected to sexual harassment at Burger King locations across the country. Weinstein, along with other high-profile figures like Bill O'Reilly, Donald Trump, and Bill Cosby, have created a watershed moment for victims of sexual harassment. But for many women, misogyny and routine harassment are still the reality at work. Now, the hope is that more than just a quarter of them will report it. Membership in both the Boy and Girl Scouts has been declining in the U.S. for years. In the perception of both as white middle-class organizations in an increasingly multicultural country isn't helping. The Boy Scouts recently announced a big shift towards greater inclusivity. Starting in 2018, they'll allow girls to join for the first time in the club's 107-year history. But the Girl Scouts are calling it a business move, an underhanded bid to boost the Boy Scouts' flagging membership roles. And it's raised questions about the need for single-gender youth programs and whether the Girl Scouts will survive. Girl Scouts are getting a crash course in feminism at the birthplace of America's women's rights movement. The girls here can't help but talk about the big news. The Boy Scouts announced they're going to let girls in. I wouldn't join a Boy Scout troop because I'm very close with this troop and we do do a lot of stuff that's fun. I don't know, and then we're also, at times we can be very girly and we'll have sleepovers and we'll talk yeah. about We have had stuff. Girl Scout like, sleepovers. <laughs> Wait, are you trying to tell me that you have the sleepover so you can talk about the boys, which yes. is why the boys shouldn't be there? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sometimes, yeah. <laughs> but beyond worrying about sleepovers and earning merit badges, we declare these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. Girl Scout troop leaders like Heather DeRider see the Boy Scouts going co-ed as an existential threat. I was infuriated that they would, in essence, take away one of the only things that both girls had to themselves, Girl Scouting, and that boys have to themselves. They have Boy Scouting, a place where girls can't infiltrate it, and they can talk about and learn about things that are important to young boys and young men. I would hate to see the organization of Girl Scouting go away because now Boy Scouting lets them in and it does become scouting as one. That skepticism goes all the way up the ranks. Girl Scouts executive Lisa Margosian argues this isn't a progressive move by the Boy Scouts, but a calculated business tactic. I would say it's probably a move of desperation. I mean, you know, I think that's really financially driven and motivated. Their financial state is a bit precarious. Margosian points to the 33% decline in Boy Scouts membership, from 3.5 million in 1996 to 2.3 million in 2016, as the real motivation behind officially welcoming girls. But for decades, there have been girls who fought to get into what they perceive to be the ultimate boys club, with feminist groups like the National Organization for Women supporting the Boy Scouts tearing down a centuries-old gender divide. A lot of feminists look at this and say, well, hang on a second, if we've been talking about equality and girls being allowed to inhabit the same spaces as boys for such a long time, why is this a problem? Equality and opportunity doesn't mean the same path there. And when you take systems designed by males for males and you impose it on a, on a, on a girl, you're not necessarily giving her an equal or fair path. The Boy Scouts are predictably male. They're volunteers, Troop leaders and executives are mostly men, and former Boy Scout presidents include powerful political and corporate men, like former Secretary of Defense Bob Gates and former Exxon CEO and current Secretary of State Rex Tillerson. 
there has never been a, a Boy Scout CEO that's been a woman. Correct. Do you think that might change in the future now that there is this move? I would think so. I, I, I think that um, there, there's no tradition that we have in place that would say the uh, chief scout executive, my position would have to be uh, a man. But male leadership aside, chief scouting executive Mike Serbar says co-ed scouting is the future. We've had girls participating for a long time in Cub Scouts, kind of unofficially. And so we kept getting a lot of pressure from our families to look at that. So you're not trying to put the Girl Scouts out of business? Of course not. We want the Girl Scouts to thrive, flourish, and grow. What we've said is if you've got an all-boy Cub Scout pack or an all-boy Boy Scout troop and you want to maintain that, we celebrate that. That's great. Keep doing it. But we know that there are many other Cub Scout packs that want to have an environment where girls are in girl dens and boys are in boy dens, and they participate together as a family in the whole pack. For their part, the Girl Scouts say they've worked hard to modernize their gender-specific programming for girls, even adding coding badges to appeal to the Snapchat generation. And they question how much research the Boy Scouts have put into this decision to go co-ed. How well suited are they to really serve girls? Um, do they have programming that really meets the needs of girls? Research you know, that we've done and others have done supports that they learn differently, their brains work differently, and they really engage with material very differently, especially as they explore their self, a sense of self and leadership. But the thing is, the research on co-ed versus single gender programming is not at all definitive. The Boy Scouts point to their own three-year-long survey of peer-reviewed gender studies that convince them to open their programs to both boys and girls. We know that scouting has been transformational in the lives of literally millions of kids, and you don't want to lose any of that. We want to make sure that there still would be the ability for boys to have leadership positions. And if we invited girls to participate in the program, there had to be an avenue for them to also get leadership. Can you imagine a scenario where a Boy Scout troop would take the girls and the boys to learn about feminist history in America, for example? I think the programs that the Girl Scouts have, have created and developed for girls are tremendous. Uh, but I also think that there's girls that are not interested in that, would probably choose something different. The key is giving parents more options. But if the Boy Scouts win the battle for the hearts and minds of American girls, Girl Scout evangelists like Serafina Sortino think that something special will be lost. There is so much more to Girl Scouts than just the cookies. There's so much outdoor stuff that like, I can't even like just start to explain it. What do you think that you've learned that you might not have if you had been in a co-ed environment? And I think just being in a girl-only environment when I'm with my Girl Scouts, I just feel more confident and I know that there's women behind me supporting me and supporting my goals. And I think that goes out into later in life. It's just an amazing experience to just be with only girls. This is not a derelict Chinatown waiting room. It's actually the James Cohen Art Gallery, which usually looks like a regular white box space. The transformation is part of an exhibit by the Israeli-American artist Omer Fast. In a statement, Fast said he wanted to restore the space to what Chinatown looked like before the art gallery started showing up. But the show has angered residents who say Fast has no right to portray Chinatown as an impoverished space. So I want to tell James Cohen Gallery what was your reaction the first time you saw this piece? I was disgusted. The exhibit is literally garbage, right? Outside is all garbage, right? right? Construction cones. Inside, you've got bags of garbage, broken ATMs, a broken fan. It's trying to show Chinatown as the poor, um, new, almost newcomer immigrants, right? When in actuality, Chinatown has been around for 150 years. There's something else going on here. These protests aren't only about the exhibit. They're about the gallery itself and its presence in Chinatown. All this is part of an anti-gentrification movement that started in the Boyle Heights neighborhood of Los Angeles. Get the fuck out of Boyle Heights. We don't want you here. We don't need you here. Anti-gentrification activists there have been pushing back against art galleries using some extreme tactics like graffiti and shutdowns of art shows. This past February, they successfully shut down a gallery who cited pressure from anti-gentrification groups. 
That movement is coming to Chinatown, which has seen dozens of galleries open up in the past 10 years. Nancy Meza has been going around the country to organize resistance. So I am here today um, standing in solidarity, right, as we are fighting to defend Bull Heights. We know that our struggles are connected, and I am here to connect. She and her fellow activists only have one demand, hand over the keys and leave. Our galleries are used as a Trojan horse business, right? They're used by speculators, by developers to kind of test out the waters. The same galleries that are, that are gentrifying Chinatown here, that are gentrifying Brooklyn, that are gentrifying all the boroughs, are the same galleries coming into Bowl Heights. So we definitely see a connection between like where the money's coming from and where the investment is going. And it always ends up being in, you know, working class communities such as Chinatown and such as Bowl Heights. In your instance in Boyle Heights, like there was no compromise. You said you must give us the keys. Like, yeah. do you think that type of tactic is necessary? Yeah. We picked such a hard line because we know we've seen the communities around us, Highland Park, Echo Park, be completely transformed. You know, a once Latino neighborhood is no longer recognizable. And we're gonna do anything we can and get creative and figure out what works and what doesn't work um, to save our hood. Jane Cohen is a partner in the James Cohen Gallery. How long did it take to convert into this sort of space? Very fast. I think we did it in three or four months. They have another location in Chelsea and expanded to Chinatown two years ago. We met with her after the fast exhibit closed. Some of the activists that we spoke to said that the work in the front, the artwork itself is irrelevant, that this is a place where they're going to do their activism, that this is sort of an opportunity for them. Does it make you angry to hear that? I do feel a bit used from that, yeah. I think that their voices should be heard. I don't know that this artist or this gallery needs to be denigrated in order for them to be heard. I think we're seen maybe as having power that we don't have, though. We are just renters. It wasn't part of what we felt we were doing when we moved down here, but I, I do understand their arguments. Do you think that sort of, I guess, patronage where you're telling an artist you can do whatever you want, if it's problematic, if people are mad about it, then you know, like we'll share part of the responsibility. Do you think that is becoming more difficult? If we sanitize everything and we only show work that we think is going to be acceptable, first of all, we're not going to succeed. And second of all, it means that we're not going to have these very important conversations about identity, about um, what are ethics in art. But right now, there's a lot of sensitivity towards making those assumptions. So maybe right now it needs to be a bit quieter in that way. Scrabble World Championships have been bringing together the best players on Earth since 1991. In 2015, Wellington Jigare from Nigeria became the first African player to take home the title, but he probably won't be the last. As it turns out, of the world's top 100 English language players, 29 are Nigerian. Next week, the 2017 World Championships will be held on the African continent for the first time. Vice News went to Nigeria to learn about the country's national obsession with a board game turned sport. My name is Wellington Vigere. I'm the World Scrabble Champion. I started playing Scrabble at the age of 14. Nigeria is one of the few countries in the world where Scrabble is considered an actual sport. It's a very, very big business in Nigeria. Today, Nigeria has more top competitors than the U.S. There are hundreds of Scrabble clubs across the country, and coaches are often on the government payroll. At the Scrabble All-Stars Tournament, first place wins $300 a big haul in a country where the average person lives on less than $6 a day. Well over 50% of the people gathered here play Scrabble professionally. So they depend on, on Scrabble to make an actual living and all that. So that is one of the factors that makes us good. Let's see that. If you're not playing, please, can you excuse us? Nigerians are known in the Scrabble world for a specific style of gameplay. Forget about focusing on large words that rack up lots of points and open up the board. The Nigerian style is designed to limit an opponent's options, keeping the board tight by using short words. 
On the final day of the tournament, the remaining players are competing for the top spots. This is the tension stage, because once you drop a game, that means you are out of it. So the tension is always very high at this point. So you even see people sweating here now. You see beads of sweat fusing from their, their faces. Stop misbehaving. Don't no. talk when you're playing scrabble. I need the maximum point at that point. In the semi-finals, Jigare faced an early deficit and couldn't recover. So I don't really he played very well. He was one of the top players in the country, and there was uh, hardly anything I could do to salvage again. I won. Congratulations to Shepherd. He's like a family, and uh, we've been with each other for so long. When you have a concentration of world-class players, I think that is one of the main factors that makes our scrabble very uh, difficult. As far as we are concerned, I think we are the leader worldwide. And I, I can assure you, it will take time before the world can displace us from this lofty position. You look stupid. Everyone else thinks you look stupid. God thinks you look stupid. Stop it. I'm taking it a favorite town. If you spend enough time on the internet, you've probably come into contact with Filthy Frank. <laughs> he's the guy that started the Harlem Shake craze. Yeah, Harlem. And he's even released a parody rap album under the name Pink Guy that reached number one in the Billboard comedy chart and top ten in hip hop. Hope you fucking die in a high speed car crash. I hope you fucking fall head first and get your neck cracked. He's pulled in over 800 million YouTube views, all from behind a laptop in his bedroom. Do you have a favorite Pink Guy track? I do. Yeah, it's 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 the one that I I made in Japanese. Yeah, I'll play it. So why is this your favorite song? Just because it's just, you know, it's my it's my native um, childhood tongue. It brings me back to my childhood mm. when I used to make songs like this. <laughs> <laughs> in real life, Frank isn't all that filthy. What? He grew up in Japan and came to the U.S. to go to college. And after blowing up and becoming an internet anti-hero, Frank isn't around all that much anymore. And as of this week, he's trying to turn over a new leaf. Roll, camera! Today, he releases his first album under his real name, Joji. It's full of songs about love and breakups. Action! When he's not making videos, he likes to hang out in this makeshift Zen garden he built in Brooklyn. You have this fan base that knows and loves you as Filthy Frank, this dude yeah. who gets thrown up on. And right now, you want to make music, which is not really related to that. Yeah. Is it hard to deal with people who really just see you as Filthy Frank and they just want more Filthy Frank? Back when I was too afraid to make the transition, it was a, it was a genuine concern. I was under the impression that you know, that was, that was my, that was my pinnacle. It's your peak. This is my opus. It's <laughs> <This laughs> is my opus. Like, <laughs> I'm going to be yelling on the internet, making semi-valid points here and there. You know, I thought that was, like, I was depressed that that was going to be it. I fell into that pit for about a year where I was just, like, pumping out shit out of fear. A few years ago, Joji uploaded a video where he broke character. Um, I have some news for all of you. He explained that he developed an illness that gave him stress-induced seizures. But a few days later, he deleted the video. It's still hard for him to talk about. I have a little brain thing that I have to, um, I gotta take medication like twice a day for it. I realized, you know, I'm not as invincible as, as I used to be. I just kind of strayed away from stuff that, that had conflict in general. What did it take for you to get that 
I guess, confidence that, okay, you know what, I want to do this now. Forget mm. what anybody who doubts me says, or forget, forget the, own, the doubt that I have. I'm worried. There's always that doubt. That this won't work out? Yeah. But also, at the same time, at least I tried. You know, that's, that's really what matters to me. The new songs about heartbreak are pulling in millions of streams. Some people miss those old videos. But Joji's managed to find a fan base that supports him either way. Thank you, man. Thank you, man. You watch me Oh, shit. So when did you start fishing? Just like with friends in, in Japan when I was younger. There's uh, a lot going on on the, on the internet that, uh, no pun intended, but I don't subscribe to that sort of behavior. We have all this. Why am I getting heated on the internet? You know what I mean? Oh, this is a big one. That actually looks pretty convincing. I think, I think it's a marlin. <laughs> Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. That's Vice News Tonight for Friday, November 3rd.